now it gave me great pleasure and honor to introduce our next guest speaker. Uh, he's none other than Pastor uh, Daniel Wee, uh, Senior Pastor of uh, Church of Our Savior, and he has great uh, extensive interest in robotics, in electronics, in programming, wow. which I know nothing about. Very and uh, <laughs> and uh, he actually was awarded the Top 10 Young Entrepreneur Award yeah, for his pioneering work in Palm Pilot and GPS services. And personally, I heard him preach once on YouTube and was really impacted by what an intelligent man, yet humble, faithful, and powerful uh, preacher of God's Word. So hope Singapore and hope global. Let's put our hands together to welcome our next speaker, Pastor Danny Wee. <laughs> You can't believe your own propaganda. <laughs> Magana umaga. Kusaka ka ngayon umaga. Mabuti for my Filipino friends. And uh, I understand there's some here from Africa. Is there, are there any from Africa out here? Yeah, somewhere. Mambo. Mambo. Yeah, so good to see all of you. Yeah, Barisa. Asubi, Asuboi, he. I'm not sure if you understand uh, Swahili. I know there are many languages in Africa. But it's such a joy to be with all of you here this morning and a privilege. I thank uh, Pastor Jeff and the uh, whole team for having me here. I thought after the last time I spoke here, I blew it so much, I'll never be invited back. But uh, apparently, I didn't do bad enough a job, right? That was such an amazing and encouraging uh, testimony, would you say? You know, people came to plug in power but end up plugging into Jesus. You know, something like that should happen a lot more often, would you say? Amen. Amen. Well, this morning, Pastor Jeff has asked me to come and share with you something about what is going on uh, at Church of Our Saviors, all the things that we're learning and we're experiencing. And I'm very happy to do that. You know, I want to begin to jump right in because we don't have all that much time. In the book of uh, God's Gospel of Luke chapter 10, and verse 30 to 36. Now, this is a passage that many of you are very familiar with, otherwise known as the parable of the Good Samaritan. And you would, let me just read for you that whole uh, six verses, seven verses. A certain man went down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell among thieves who stripped him of his clothing wounded him and departed, leaving him half dead. Now, by chance, a certain priest came down that road. He saw him. He passed by on the other side. And likewise, a Levite, when he arrived at that place, came and looked, and he passed by on the other side. But a certain Samaritan, as he journeyed, came where he was. And when he saw him, he had compassion. He went to him, bandaged his wounds, poured on oil and wine, and he set him on his own animal, brought him to an inn, and took care of him. On the next day, when he departed, he took out two denarii, gave them to the innkeeper, and said to him, Take care of him, and whatever more you spend when I come again, I will repay you. So which of these three do you think was the neighbor to him who fell among the thieves? Let us pray. Father, we thank you for your word today. We thank you for this amazing gathering of people from all nations and also different congregations being here together in this conference. And Lord, we know that you have a word for us. And we pray that you bring us that revelation this morning. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. It's also good and exciting to see uh, all of you congregating together. You know, actually, 2,000 years ago, last week, uh, was uh, Pentecost, and the disciples were gathered all in one accord, not Honda Accord, nah, but all accord in the upper room. And you guys are one week late, but you know, it's still good because Pastor Jeff told me that in hope every week is Pentecost. Huh? <laughs> is that true? Right? Every week the Holy Spirit is speaking to us and empowering us, sending us out to be his witnesses. This has not changed for 2,000 years. This is the mission of the church, but the method has changed because the world around us has changed. 
Now this particular parable that Jesus told is very interesting because in verse 31 it says that by chance, everyone say by chance. You know, many Christians like to say, I don't believe in luck. Right? I don't believe in chance, right? But actually, the Bible says by chance, a certain priest came down that road. I think this is so interesting because by chance, the few students were looking for a power plug. Right? By chance. I suppose you could call it that. Lah. But you are more spiritual than you say by divine appointment. Lah. But same concept, right? By chance, you didn't plan it. You didn't say, have a booth where foreign students looking for power, please come here. You didn't. It happened by chance. So many opportunities pass by in our lives daily by chance. Not always in the midst of planned programs. Not always in ways that you expect it to be, but somehow something happened in the course of ordinary day-to-day -day life. About a year ago, there was a lady, a Chinese lady, who came to our church. And she came, you know, we were wondering, why, why did you come to church? I said, to be honest, my dog dragged me to church. She was walking a dog, right? By chance. And straight away, we thought, you know what, we should install fire hydrants in our church. So all the dogs would come there to pee, you know, and drag the owners to our church. You know, things that happen, sometimes seemingly without rhyme or reason, could be turned into a divine appointment. So this chance encounter did not happen in organized meetings and actually for most of us, the vast majority of you, the things that God wants to do in our lives is going to happen, I guess, almost by chance. It could happen anytime. It could happen today. It happened yesterday. It could happen tomorrow. And we should never rule that out. There are opportunities, chance opportunities everywhere and every day in your home, in your neighborhood, in your workplaces, in your school, your gym, your leisure time, what we need to do is we need to open our eyes and be sensitive enough to recognize when such a door of opportunity is opening up before us. And you no, know, the door open doesn't mean you will go through it, right? But that's the whole point, to recognize the door and to seize that opportunity. Because sometimes you might look at that opportunity or that chance and you think this is more trouble than it is worth. So there are opportunities right now for all of us if you would just open your eyes and start looking for it. You know, there was a lady who came to our church on 15 July last year and she showed up in church by chance, by accident. Actually, the reason she came was because she took the wrong bus. And when she realized she was on the wrong bus, she decided to get off the church and it happened to be in front of our church, right? Get off the bus, sorry, get off the church, get off the bus. It happened to be in front of our church. She came into the service that day and she wound up responding to the altar call. She came into the church, she accepted Christ, and on October last year, after many months of coming to church, she got baptized. All of this happened by chance. I'm not sure how many of you in your life could say that, you know, your coming to Christ happened at an unplanned opportunity, an unplanned occasion in your life. There are many things, there are a lot of things that God is doing all around us. The first thing I want to impress upon you is that there are many, many, many opportunities all around you today, right under your noses sometimes, and we need to be more invested in what God is doing. Look around and begin to recognize here is an opportunity, just like that Chinese pastor who walked past and realized that this could be an opportunity. Just go for it, right? And that's one of my favorite things. Just say, go for it. Yeet it lah. Just go for it, right? And we will make him look good. He will, God will make us look good when we make him look good. You know, there was another chance occasion. Because in our church, we realized that, you know, we want to make most of these chances. So one of my staff came to me and said, Pastor, our church is on the PCN. PCN is the bar connector network, right? And many people cycle past the church. Can we put bicycle pump and service station in front of our church. I was thinking, wow, church people will score me. Take church money and put bicycle pump, bicycle station, right? Honestly, I was not very keen on the idea, but after some persuasion, I thought, I thought okay, go for it. I didn't know why bicycle pump cost so much, a few thousand dollars. Huh? Put there, everything. Next thing we know, last year, there were two boys who were cycling from Bukit Bato to East Coast. And happened to cycle past our church and their tire was a little bit flat. So they got off the bicycle, they saw the pump, they started pumping the tire. And one of our church members saw that, 
by chance and asked, hey, it's Saturday, we have a youth service, would you like to come in? You know, they came to church and we started following up with them for several months after, all by chance. Look, all you need to do is say yes to those chances, to say yes to those opportunities. It's like saying no, so troublesome, so expensive. So there are lots of things that God is doing all around us, right? And today, in our present day context, we don't always, we don't always have to wait for chances to happen. We can make these opportunities happen. You can do something intentional to make opportunities like this happen in your life. And as a church community, I can see that you're doing a lot of it. You're going to houses, you're going to places, you're serving people. All of these are actually opportunities for something to happen, for a miracle to happen. Now, I want you to notice that these two guys came down the road, the priest and the Levite. And they were either on their way to Jerusalem or coming from Jerusalem, perhaps because they were performing some religious duties. They were, after all, the priest and the Levite. They were not bad people. And some people suggested that perhaps the reason they did not help the wounded man was because they thought maybe he was dead. And you know, with these priests and Levites, the moment you touch a dead body, you are considered unclean, you are defiled. So you cannot go and serve in the temple. So perhaps they were being religious, they were thinking about their religious duties and what they have to do to serve, you know. Oh, I can't help this person because, you know, I've got to go to church, I've got to sing in the choir, I've got to, I've got to lead in this, I'm ushering, but I can't do this. The same kind of thinking going on there. They were not bad people, okay, let's not get them wrong, right? It could be any one of us. So they, they were not, you know, looking at the opportunity, they were thinking about what they were, they had planned to do. So, this religious concern resulted them responding in a particular way. The Bible says they came, they saw, they, they didn't conquer, but they passed by on the other side. They passed by on the other side of the road. I don't know how wide the road was, I've actually been there, but I'm not sure in those days how wide it was, but they pass by on the other side. Now, since this is a parable, then it is incumbent upon us to ask our question, what is this metaphor about? The other side of what for us today? Because you and I, we're not in Jerusalem, going down to Jericho, we're not doing that. So what is this other side? And I'll suggest to you a few ways we can look at this road, the other side of the road. First of all, the other side could be a potentially disruptive situation. Right? Messes up your day. Who knows what is going on with that man lying down on the side of the road? Who knows if there are not some bandits waiting behind the stone? When I go there, they might jump on me and I become the victim. Who knows if he is already dead, right? And then in which case, there's no point for me to risk my schedule to bother with a dead person. But who knows that this person could mess up my life? cause me to be late for where I'm going. The simple act of just crossing the road to the other side carried with it the possibility of considerable disruption to one's neatly ordered life. Now, Singaporeans by nature are very curious people. I know that whenever you drive on the road and you see there's a traffic jam slowing down, Usually, what it means is not that there's a jam on the road. It means that everyone is stopping to look at the accident, right? This is usually why the accident happens. Because when you get there, you realize the accident is on the side of the road. No reason to stop, but everyone is very curious why nobody actually stops, right? Because you've got things to do. So, this could be us avoiding disruption in our life. And sometimes, it can be quite disruptive, right? It can be quite disruptive to stop what you're doing, stop your plans and go and do something that just happens by chance. Something that just happens by chance. Secondly, the other side could refer to the unfamiliar. Right? The unfamiliar. Sometimes we see something, we see an opportunity, but it's unfamiliar. Many years ago when I was a young student, I remember I was at a bus stop in front of then the National Library, very old library, okay, not the new one, the old library. And I was standing there and God told me, you see the man there in my heart, share the gospel with him. I look at, across at this man. You know, I love him in the love, in the love of Christ, right? But he's got tattoos on his hand, right, from the top to bottom. So first thing I told the Lord is, he speaks Hokkien, I don't, right? 
because I was afraid. I look, he looks like Hokkien speaker. He looks like Pastor James, right? So he looks like Hokkien speaker. I don't speak Hokkien, so how am I going to speak to him? You know, I was afraid of going there. In fact, I told the Lord, you know, I, I actually delayed that for a very long time. My God was getting upset with me. I felt it, you know. I said, okay, Lord, Lord, uh, my bus is coming. You know, my, I literally can see my bus arriving, so I can't talk to him. Uh, I got there, he got on the same bus, you know. Sometimes things just happen like that. But the road, the other side of the road could be something unfamiliar, something that disrupts your schedule. And the funny thing that is that most of these excuses that we have for not crossing the road will vanish if on the other side of the road you saw a pot of gold. Or suddenly no excuse already, right? Oh, no, no, I can wait. I can, just, I can be late for my, for my uh, appointment if there was a pot of gold across the road, right? Or you won't say, well, what if that gold was too heavy and I can't carry? You will not think like this. You will just go for it. Am I right? But you are so holy. Yeah. <laughs> you will go for gold, right? Because then we come to this unlikely protagonist of our parable, Samaritan man, who was not very liked by the Jews. Right? There's a historical uh, enmity between them. Like the priest and the Levite, he was just traveling along the road to Jericho by chance. And he came upon this wounded man. His actions, however, were very different. Whereas the priest and Levite came and saw and passed by on the other side of the road, avoiding potential disruption, avoiding the inconvenience, this Samaritan in verse 33 says, he came to where he was. He came nearby to that person. He came close enough to see and he had compassion. First thing I want you to notice is that compassion came after. You know, many people tell me, Pastor, pray for me that I have more compassion for the lost. Listen, friends, compassion comes after. You go first, right? You go first. And then when you're there, compassion will come. In fact, compassion sometimes may not last very long also. Right? The feeling, you know, just saying the song feeling. You know, many years ago, I literally crossed the road. When I first came to church, I was saying, I literally crossed the road to Mailing Street, where there are a lot of rental flats. And I, I wanted to take photographs, right? Because I, I was a photographer. So I went there to take photographs of this. You know, you always like to take photographs of poor people. So I went there to look for poor people, you know, look at the houses and all that. You know, it just makes for more interesting photographs, right? Uh, I mean, who wants to see a photograph of a rich person? eating cake, right? So, I went there, and because I spoke Malay, I started talking to some of these residents in this rental flats. Now, I, honestly, I wasn't expecting very much, but, you know, I got quite friendly with one very elderly couple, and I found out that they had no electricity because they couldn't pay for the electricity. Now, at that moment, my Christian compassion came out. Honestly, before I went there, I had no compassion. I just want to take photo. Now, my Christian compassion came up, right? And I thought, you know what? Let me do the right thing. I will pay for your electricity bill. And then the next month I came, I paid for that electricity bill again. I could just feel the compassion going. The fourth month, I didn't have money, you see. So, my compassion wasn't quite there. And then they called me. Are you coming to pay our bill? My confession vanished straight away. <laughs> you know, sometimes our uh, confession is fickle, right? But the command of God is not. Amen? So, we are supposed to go, right? This Samaritan, he went first. Compassion came afterwards. Now, I noticed that sometimes for us, you know, it's hard for us to cross this road, right? This What does this road represent? Of course, in this story, it was just... A location. It was just a physical separation from one side to the other side. Today, we can think of other kinds of separations, right? Other kinds of barriers. And I think the two greatest barriers today, separating us on this side of the road and to all those wounded people on the other side of the road, which God wants us to go there, would be the social and the cultural barrier. Social and cultural barriers. You know, we might want to reach a hawker, right? Someone who's... Uh, in the service industry, and sometimes we could just be stumped about how to cross that social divide. You are there, he's there, but you don't know what to say. You know, recently I preached about this in church, and one of my church members came up to me the week after he said, Pastor, after you preach, I went to a hawker center, and I wanted to bless the people there. You know, I started talking to strangers, and I offered to buy a drink for him. 
I said I was so proud of him. I said, Pastor, the story not finished. I went to buy a drink for him, and while in my excited uh, nurse, I spilled the drink, I dropped all the straws, and everyone was upset with me. I said, you know, compassion is not always the result, right? Sometimes accidents could be the result. And you know what he said? I'm going back again. I'll make it right. Wow. You know what I mean? Going across the road is not always convenient, but it is difficult. It is awkward at times. And many times, because it's so awkward, and we are so shy, we don't want to embarrass ourselves, we end up crossing on this side of the road, often offering up a silent prayer for that person, but never, ever going to where that person was. I had to learn this myself. To be very honest, I am an introvert. You can tell how introverted I am. I suspect that most of you are introverted. You know, as far as I can tell, about 70% of churchgoers are introverts. Maybe not this church. I see your, your church are quite hip, you know, you've got all these people on stage. Most people are introverts. Well, my theory is very simple, right? The extroverts, they go to pub, they go to zoo, you know, they go to disco. The introverts, they go for a meeting, that's why you end up in church, right? So, so I, I find it very awkward to cross that social and cultural divide and talk to people. I find it very awkward. Until one day, I was with a friend. We were in Starbucks, actually Coffee Bean. And while we were ordering the food, she brought out a small bag of perfume for the person serving. I said, what are you doing? You right? And they say hi, and she called this person by name, and they chatted and all that. I so, wow, can you do this? This person, when we got served our order, brought extra stuff for us, right? So I thought, wow, not only is this good, uh, it comes with benefits. So I thought, you know what? I'm an introvert, but I can do this. So I always go to a Japanese restaurant to eat. So I thought, you know what? I should do this. I will buy some very awfully nice chocolates, you know, uh, and, you know, I during one of these uh, mooncake uh, events, I brought it to them, I gave to the whole restaurant. They liked it so much. From that day onwards, whenever I go to that soup restaurant to eat, I get extra free soup, right? So I'm not saying this to get free soup, right? I'm saying that you can make an impact on people's life when you actually overcome your awkwardness and cross the road. You follow what I'm saying? Can you say amen? Now, as if this is not enough, there's also a cultural barrier to cross. Sometimes it's just a social barrier. You just don't know that person. You don't want to talk to strangers. You don't want people to think that you're weirdo, right? But there's also a cultural barrier to be crossed. What happens if that person, you know, is from China and I just get one, right? I speak English, the Queen's English, right? And they are England, not so power, right? So maybe there's a communication problem there. What if they are a different race? What if they are speaking a different language and I cannot relate to them. What if our economic classes are very different? You know how it's difficult, right? Some people who are staying in condominium, trying to relate to some people who are staying in rental flats, can be quite difficult. All of these are barriers that we need to cross. So in our church, we realize that there are many such people all around us every day. In fact, we realize that in our church, the people who clean our church were not Christians. They were from an Indian company. They were not Christians. So we realized, how could it be possible that we are a church preaching the gospel, telling everybody to come to Christ, and then we have these weekly, yearly cleaners in our church who do not know Christ. And we never thought to cross the social and cultural barrier just to touch their lives. So last year, we decided that, you know what, we got to do something about it. This is not right. We need to do something about it. So we started a Thursday afternoon service. We went and invited these people to our church, hoping that they would respond. And sure enough, they did respond. In fact, all but one of the cleaners have accepted Christ. And last year, one of them got uh, baptized. He was so on fire. He decided it's not good enough for us to come. We'll invite the security guards also. So. Then at that time, I started calling all the churches around me. Hey, by the way, your church cleaner, they can come or not. Many times they tell me they cannot come. They cannot come because they are contract cleaners. So they don't have free time to come. You know, what about your security guard? Security guard, they don't need security, right? They cannot come contract security guard. You know, many people all around us are actually across the road. You see what I'm saying? They are all around us. You know, this guy, he got so excited. He crossed the road to the 
shell. These are new believers. Uh. He just became a Christian less than one month. He crossed the road to the shell station, talked to the Indian manager, asked for permission for all his service staff to come to our Thursday. And actually, here we have a picture here. Actually, you can see the guy wearing red and yellow. That is the shell attendant from across the road coming to church. It's not a big service. It's not a very slick service. But they are there, and I'm just so amazed. In fact, recently, one of them brought their roommate to Christ. These are people we could never normally reach because you know why? We represent about 20% of Singapore. There's 80% of Singaporeans who are on the other side of the road that we haven't figured out how to reach. So this is one of the things we are doing, right? Crossing the social and cultural divide. Now, I want you to consider this. If it is so hard for you to cross that road to that side, do you expect that wounded person who is left or half dead to cross the road to your side? In fact, no. But actually, a lot of the way we do church and Christianity is like this. We're waiting for people to come to our side, right? When they figure out how to do it, how to dress up, how to get their life together, get their act together, then they come to church. The truth is that will not happen. And this is why Christianity in Singapore, I think, is stagnating. So, because of this, we are constantly looking for ways, devising ways that we can cross over to the other side. What we need isn't more compassion. We need to go. That's the thing. And in fact, your going to them is compassion. I want to explain this to you because, you know, we think that I need to have compassion. Listen, when you go and you bandage up their wounds, when you do something for them, when you clean their houses, when you invest your time and money, yes, money is involved, when you invest your time, your money, your effort, your attention on them instead of playing Roblox, right? Some of us play Roblox or, you know, Valorant or whatever it is. When you invest that time that you could have been used for this to their lives, they will see it as compassion. They will see it as compassion. You know, in February this year, we had a concert in our church and we invited our friends and parents and, uh, you know, people who have never been in church before. Uh, I actually have a video, short video, it's not very important, just to show you what kind of concert it was. Because in this concert, we didn't have any Christian songs, right? We didn't uh, sing any churchy stuff. It was just a uh, concert with Chinese folk music, that popular music, sing yao and all this kind of stuff, so that our parents could come, right? Okay. Yeah, something like this. We had a full orchestral concert. Now, we are about 2,000 people come, about 60% first time in church, right? And one of these people who came was someone called Uncle Ling. Uncle Ling didn't want to come, but he was sending the children. But last minute, he decided that, okay, like, I don't mind coming, right? But he discovered that this is a non-Christian event, although he was in a Christian church. So he came in, we quickly scrambled to find tickets for him. He came in and apparently he enjoyed it very much. Now, Uncle Ling was a Bakwa seller, okay, in Bedou, very far from our church in Margaret Drive, long, long, this, halfway across the country. And it was his very first time in church. And the children told us the day after that, hey, my dad really enjoyed the service, you know. So at that point of time, one of my pastors said, you know what, this is a good opportunity. Why don't we take this opportunity and share the gospel with him. And if we do, this could solve our Bakwa problem, hands up, and, you know, and so on, right? So that very day, it was a Sunday, right? He, uh, sorry, it was a Saturday. He drove all the way to Pedro, to this uncle's, uh, to visit his Bakwa store, to buy some Bakwa from him, $100 of Bakwa, right? To give to somebody and to share the gospel with him. Now, the uncle said, Adia, this is this guy quite young now. You know, after yesterday's concert, I already 60% there already. After you share, I 80% there. But which means not 100% here, right? So, uh, my uh, pastor said, now can I pray for you? Pray for his back. After he prayed for his back, he said, what should I do with the Kuan Yin in my house? You know? What should I do with the idol in my house? I guess it's more than 80% of the way there, right? So, we decided to ask him, hey, can we connect you to a church in Bedou? You know, Bedou, what many churches, right? All called BBTC, right? So we said, well, there's a very good church here, very near your place. Why don't you go to this church? Now, this uncle, very interesting response. He said, no, I don't want, I want to go to your church. We said, our church is very far. Now, he replied in Chinese. He said, you've seen, uh, you've seen, 
right? If you have a heart, you're not afraid of the distance. 没有心 if you don't have a heart, 在隔壁都没有空去 right? If you don't have a heart, you, they don't see your compassion. Even next door, they will not go. Listen, friends, when you cross the divide, when you go there, that is a sign of your sin. It's a sign of your compassion. This is what the 80 percent of Singapore is looking for. They are not interested in our doctrine. They are not interested in our philosophy, our theology, the courses that we run, as good and important as these things may be to us. But to them, it means nothing. All they want to see is your compassion. You know what they say, right? People don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. So this is very important, right, for all of us to not just have compassion in your heart, but to go and in so going display your compassion. In December last year, a couple from our church, by chance. Met Uncle Anthony at Pekio Market. Pekio Market is also not our territory, but we don't have territorial spirit. One, right? we we every territory is our, ours also. And they felt led to invite him to join online alpha, online alpha because you know no chance of him coming to church. So the uncle said yes. Now here's what's interesting: for the next ten weeks, this couple will visit this uncle every alpha night. To sit through Alpha online together with him, so it wasn't online Alpha. Ten weeks, you know. You know, many times we do evangelism, when you do conversion, ah, you just want to spend about fifteen minutes to convert somebody, to argue about something, and hopefully you can win your argument and persuade him that he is a sinner, that there's one God, and that he needs Jesus Christ. After that, you wash your hands, bye bye, right? Here, this people invested ten weeks, and in fact, we know. In this day and age, conversion is not not enough. It's not sufficient. In fact, I can tell you that a few years ago, our church had about twelve thousand conversions in one year. But of that twelve thousand, maybe less than thirty got baptized. Because conversion is about the head. What we are looking for today is adoption, to adopt the whole person into the family of the church, so that one day they can feel belonging to this group, just like you are here, right? Not conversion, but adoption. Now, conversion is about perhaps persuading someone of an idea. But when you are going to be adopted in the family, a lot of other things come through, right? I must go and see your house. Whether I like your house, I like the people in your house. Do I like the habits of your house? It's a lot more involved, and relationship is needed. So this couple, you know, after the whole alpha course is finished. Thank you very far. We wanted to connect them to another very good church, Agape Baptist Church. His answer was, "I don't want. I want to come to your church. Your people are nice, friends. This is how you win the eighty percent on their side of the road. This is how you cross the road. Not by investing a few hours, but investing your life in a relationship with them." Can you say Amen? You know, there was another proprietor in our uh, one of the food court next to our church. And I just realized I got eight minutes left. <coughs> This uh, proprietor is uh, from China, right? And uh, we try to support them, so we go there eat. They will always send us their menu on WhatsApp, you know. So you know, today we got this, we got that dish. One day, because they have our WhatsApp, one day he saw that one of our pastors uh, had a thing, uh, has a picture of him bouldering in his WhatsApp profile picture, and she got very excited. Say, hey, what is this? Ah,、uh, bouldering. Do you know what? How to say bouldering in Chinese? Pass your toes up here. Pan yan, pan yan. Okay, say that's how bad our Chinese is. Show the pan yan. So we say, you know what we say? We'll bring you tomorrow. She's tomorrow. Ah, so fast. You know, how can they say my toes? Yeah, right. You got opportunity, seize it, strike while the iron is hot. The next day, she came、uh, bouldering with us, our families. Had such a great time. That weekend we said, "When did you come to church?" She liked us so much. She said, "Wow, if, if you guys do rock climbing, it's so good. Why not?" She came to church, and now we were thinking in our mind that, well, we'll get her to church a few weeks, then we get her into Alpha group, right? And then maybe a few weeks down Alpha road, she'll accept Christ. We'll talk to her about baptism. You know, the first Sunday she came to church, she accepted Christ three times, right? Just to be sure. The following week, she brought her two children. One of them accepted Christ. The other one accepted Christ. Now we are working on husband. We are eating that practically every day. We are investing our time, our money, and the relationship. Friends, 
You can do it too. I tell your neighbor, I say, you can do this. I tell you, there are perks to this thing. Because now when I eat there, they, they have I, Ice Milo is not on their menu, huh? but they'll prepare Ice Milo, Milo just for me, you know. Listen, there are perks to building relationships and not just converting people. Amen? So unlike, tradi- unlike traditional evangelism, our goal is not just to get people to say the sinner's prayer. Our goal is not just apologetics and polemics. Our goal is for these people to become part of the family. And when they are touched by our love, you know what's going to happen? Second order evangelism. They are going to bring the uncle, auntie, their friend, their children, their family, because they love it so much. And that is what good news should look like. I have uh, another story here, and I'll try to finish it soon. I think I'll almost finish it here. We had an Indonesian maid who came to our church. And uh, for the very first time, right? And this Indonesian maid, because she was new, came to our welcome corner, and we started asking, hey, you know, who brought you to church? And she said, oh, my ma'am asked me to come to church. And we were quite surprised, okay? Um, so how come your ma'am asked you to come here? Because she stays quite far away, right? I'll say, my ma'am says, uh, other church no good, this church good. Wow. Honestly, in my heart, uh, a little bit of pride, uh, which I repent of, but, you know. Then we assume, your ma'am must be our church member, right? Who else would say this kind of thing? So we ask, which service does your ma'am attend? Say, oh, no, 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 my ma'am is not Christian, she's Buddhist. Wow. You know, I'm like, suddenly, you know what? You can touch people so much that even before they join your church, before they become a Christian, they are already responding to the love of God because we have been investing, not just one time, huh? not just sharing the gospel with them once, but investing in their relationship. You know, in closing, I just want to say that 60 to 80% of Singaporeans are actually found on the other side of the road. They are not necessarily going to come to the programs that we organize, right? Once or twice a year, we have Christmas and Easter program. I know we are trying to, but every church in Singapore is trying to do the same thing. We are all trying to reach the same people. And actually, they can feel quite harassed. That's why usually around that time, they disappear, right? They knew that you are coming already, right? But there's all these other people that nobody has reached. You know, this lady that we reached, she never heard of Jesus Christ before. Can you believe it? In Singapore, there are people who do not know anything about Jesus Christ. And we can easily bring them to the Lord. Not with complicated arguments, not with very expensive programs, but just you crossing the line and investing in a relationship with them. I have so many more stories, but I don't have time to tell you that. But I do want to tell you one last story. In January of 1941, 1940, I think, 1941. A 27-year-old young man by the name of David Livingston was in London in the midst of his clinical training, wanting to become a doctor. And while he was there, he had, I guess you could call it, a chance encounter with a South African missionary by the name of Robert Moffat. Right, Robert Moffat. And he, Robert Moffat was sharing about his experience in South Africa. And one of the things he said was this. He said, Many a morning have I found myself on the front porch of my house, looking northward. He was in South Africa. He was looking north to the rest of Africa. And I've seen the smoke from the villages where Christ is not known. Where people do not know Jesus Christ. I have seen at different times, he said, the smoke of a thousand villages where the villagers are without Jesus Christ, without God, and without a hope in the world. The smoke of a thousand villagers. Now, when David Livingston heard this, he could have done like many of us, pray for them more, right? Maybe if you are a little bit more moved, send some money, right? But David Livingston's reaction was a bit different. When he heard that, he realized that, wow, there are no missionaries there. I have to go. Because if I don't go, who will go? So, his course of his life from that moment changed. He spent the rest of his life traveling an estimated 29,000 miles on foot, going through the heart of Africa, mapping it out because nobody else has been there before, crossing social, cultural, 
various pain, the ultimate price of not just a bit of money, a few hours of his life, but the whole of his life as a living sacrifice. And he became the guy who brought the light of Christ to the dark continent. Wow! This is what we are being presented with today. Now, you don't have to go to Africa. I actually have an African a service, you know, that I run over Zoom, right? Over Zoom. And it's growing, it's crazy what God is doing there. But we don't have to go to Africa. Right now, where you are, there are many such people all around you. As I said, in Singapore, 80%, that's every 5%, 4%, is a potential person on the other side of the road. But we have to become adaptive. And you must be willing to say, you know, God, I got to change my mind. I don't just want to hit and run. I want to start investing my life in these people. It may mean learning to speak Hokkien. Right? Like me, I try to speak Hokkien and Mandarin more. Because every time I go to eat, now I have to help them do their church homework. Now, Bible study, but she asked me, a pastor, this pastor, that. So, what I'm eating, I'm doing in Chinese, the homework for them. It may mean learning different languages, you know. And I do learn to say, I'm going to learn to ask to you know, our Filipino friends. I say, I'm going to say, I'm going to say, I'm going to say, right? I say, all these different languages, listen, Google Translate, la, right? But you have to be willing. So, today, I want to give you that opportunity. I know the opportunities are actually there, but an opportunity for you to say to God, God, I want to make it my intentional purpose to cross this line. So not just to go to where everybody has gone, but to cross this line across the road, whenever and wherever you see those opportunities, and if there are no opportunities, to create opportunities to do so. There are many, many, many such opportunities. In my house, there are, there are cleaners who are Bangladesh. Bangladeshi. I can tell you, I can barely say two words in Bangladeshi. Right? So one of those, one of those uh, languages seem to learn. But we have been reaching out to them. And frankly, after many years of reaching out, they still have a come to church. But you know what? You keep reaching out. Huh? Because someday the miracle may happen. Someday the breakthrough could come. But the day will never come if we never cross the road. You follow what I'm saying? It's not just about crossing once or twice. It's about consistently investing and building up relationship. So today, as we end, I want to give you that opportunity. Uh, I understand that there's a chance for you to respond to God for us and our goals to stand up together. As we close our eyes, maybe some of you will just ask God to open your eyes. Who are these people on the other side of the road for you today? Who are these people?
people who are yet far from you. 